Madame l'ambassadrice, chers amis, dear friends, my name is Bertrand Michalter, I'm uh, the director of the Institut Français du Royaume-Uni, and uh, together with all the team, together with uh, Mathias Rambeau, the head of our book department, it is uh, really a pleasure to host you uh, today for this uh, uh, conversation that we are very much uh, looking uh, forward to, uh, and um, which is part of our uh, Beyond Words uh, Festival. And I really invite you to uh, to look at the uh, at the program. Uh, I see that some of you uh, have it, uh, and uh, uh, and you'll see that you, we have uh, a lot of uh, of events coming also uh, till the end of uh, of the week. Um, most notably tomorrow with the much uh, anticipated conversation with uh, Eric um, Eric Vuya. Uh, also on Friday, a special evening about uh, Colette uh, with Deborah Levy. Uh, and we'll also have a fascinating discussion about Orlando uh, with Paul Preciado on, uh, on, uh, on Friday. So uh, uh, look, for, for, look out for the program, and it's, it's still time to, uh, uh, to, to get tickets for all those uh, events. Now allow me to, um, I, I don't know whether we really need to introduce uh, our, our guests, but I, I'll, uh, I'll do it. Um, uh, and we are really honored and, and delighted to, to host uh, uh, Ian Mackey one tonight at the, at the Institute. Uh, to my shame and to our shame, it's been many years since you last came to, uh, to, to, to the Institut Francais, and we will need to look back at, back at our archives uh, to look out for this uh, conversation that you had here uh, also at the, uh, at the, uh, at the Institut. Um, Ian McEwan is obviously the acclaimed author of uh, more than 20 novels uh, and two short story collections. Uh, his first published work, a collection of short stories called First Love, Last Rites won the Somerset Mom Award. And, uh, and uh, Ian McEwan's novels have received numerous awards, including the Booker Prize from Amsterdam, for Amsterdam and the Prix Femina Etranger for The Child in Time. Uh, more than 10 of his works have been adapted for the big screen, including Atonement, Enduring Love, The Children Act, and On Chisel Beach. Uh, his work has been translated into uh, 30 languages, including into French, by France Camus uh, Pichon, and published by uh, Gallimard. Uh, and uh, his, uh, the latest novels uh, that uh, you probably have uh, read uh, and that we will talk about tonight, uh, Lessons will be published in, uh, in France in, uh, on the fi I'm looking for Tiffany, on the 5th of, uh, of October, uh, and we are very much also looking uh, forward to, the, to, to, to this publication. Just today, uh, Ian McEwan has been uh, awarded the highest French distinction in the field of uh, culture, the insignia of Commandeur des Arts et des Lettres uh, by uh, Mrs. Hélène Duchesne, uh, the French ambassador, uh, for his achievements in the field of, uh, of literature. Um, tonight, Ian McEwan will be in conversation with uh, Ted Hodgkinson. Ted, thank you very much for being with us uh, again uh, tonight here at the, uh, at the Institute. Ted is a trustee of English Pen uh, and chaired the International Booker Prize in 2020. Um, signed copies of uh, Ian McEwan books, uh, both in English and in French translations, are available downstairs, thanks to our partner, uh, South Kensington Bookshop and La Librairie La Page. Uh, and tonight we will also have some readings in French and uh, in English by Olivia Ross. Olivia started a career at the Shakespeare's Globe Theatre and has since uh, performed in award-winning shows such as Killing Eve and War and Peace. In France, she has an extended career working in auteur cinema with directors such as Olivia Zayas, Mia Ansenov and Benoit Jaco. I wish you now a very pleasant evening. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Bertrand. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as you mentioned, Olivia will give a reading in just a moment, but I'm going to just begin by um, briefly mentioning the novel and asking a couple of questions, if I may, Ian. I just want to start by saying it's a beautifully coordinated neck arrangement you have there with your award, and it's... it's um, I, I didn't realise, you, you, you know, the green is... is beautifully um, coordinated. You think um, Saint-Marche, green, green on green? Um, <laughs> well, I, I did know about that. I looked online and saw what a beautiful object this is, but <laughs> when I was choosing a necktie, I just chose the nearest. 
So it's a happy chance. Well, congratulations. Um, it's a real pleasure to be talking to you this evening about lessons, which, to my mind, is your most expansive and, in some ways, your most personal novel to date. And as many people will know here, it ranges from the 1950s up to the present. And it's a vivid portrait, and to borrow a line from the novel, of the minuscule and momentous events which shape a life. In reading back through your work ahead of this evening, um, I was struck by how often, particularly in a couple of novels prior to Lessons, you, you have a very tight focus often on a particular character at a particular pivotal moment in their life, whereas with Lessons, you're really taking in the arc of a whole life, almost the entire of Roland's life. And I wondered what brought about that widening of frame for you. Well, I take a step backwards with that question. I mean, I've always been interested in character. Um, the depiction of a person uh, within the pages of a, let's, a social realist novel is a matter of really high artifice. I mean, it, it, and it's somewhat dependent, I think, on our love of gossip. Uh, one of the most delightful uh, human pursuits, maybe better even than the opera, is talking about other people, <laughs> um, either uh, in terms of praise or, or condemnation. But um, gauging the motives, the nature, the intentions of other people uh, is what uh, I think is almost like the basic currency mm. of, of human exchange. And it also has its... its, its um, darker elements. It defines in-groups against out-groups and so on. Um, and you could think of the novel, or I think of the novel, as a form of higher gossip. Uh, and it works for us as readers, I think, when we start to imagine that we almost know these people, whether it's Madame Bovary or, or, or whoever, Anna Karenina. You could almost think of them as someone who lives on your street. Uh, so, somewhat against the modernist trend, remember famously Virginia Woolf said, uh, character is dead. Um, this was actually long before she then went on to create the beautiful character of Mrs. Dalloway. Uh, in other words, the novel got the better of her. You can make these pronouncements, but in fact, the human element comes and just throws you all your theories overboard. So that for me has been one of the most central elements of, in my writing. To follow a person over a lifetime is suddenly to have another dimension. I mean, not within a, a moment of crisis, and I accept, you know, I have done that a few times, uh, that then has to be investigated. But to see how a person changes, mutates, evolves, or disintegrates over time and novels are very good at doing time, uh, is an, another way of, of examining mm. what the nature of character is. So that, that's been very important for me. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'll leave it that for the moment because there's lots more to say about character. Yes, um, so there is this expansive frame capturing almost the entirety of Roland Bain's life, but there are also in a way, there are refrains in the novel that, that recur, and there's a particular set of encounters that he re returns to. Um, in particular, there's a formative, and he doesn't describe it as such initially, but he comes to describe it as an abusive relationship with his piano teacher, Miriam Cornell, which later develops into a passionate, and as he describes it, premature love affair. Um, we'll talk more about that relationship in a moment, but just, just in terms of the treatment of time in the novel and the structure and the centrality of music. I wondered if you ever conceived, as you were writing of it, writing it, as having musical movements or of, of using, or of thinking of it in musical terms as a work. Well, um, music does play a big part of my life and uh, in my imagination and has become a sort of integral element, I suppose, of my mental furniture and the relationship between music and literature fascinates me because um, there's a way in which 
we have been persuaded by some of the great critics of our time, William Empson, who wrote a very famous book that we all had to read when we were in our late teens, uh, Seven Types of Ambiguity. Uh, you still have to read that. Do you? <laughs> I'm really glad to hear that. It has not been swept away by other things. Um, it's a, yes, it's a celebration of the ambiguous nature of language. And uh, I'm rather persuaded, many years ago, when Stephen Pinker wrote a book called The Language Instinct, and he said, let's talk about the ambiguity of language. Here's a description of the mating habits of an octopus. And he quotes a passage from a natural history book about the extraordinary things that go on between octopuses. Uh, and he said at the end of that, how ambiguous was that? In other words, and famously he said, I ink symbols on a page, I've transferred thoughts from one person to another into your head. The concision, the precision of language outweighs the ambiguity by a, a colossal amount. So if we think of music as being abstract, it clearly is, it's not saying anything, uh, one almost immediately runs into a kind of hesitancy about this because mm. and I was giving a speech at the Barbican the other day um, doing an event with the London Symphony Orchestra. Uh, so I was going to give readings interspersed with passages of music. And it was right at the beginning. And I was saying that there's a very famous line of Philip Larkin, um, in a poem called The Trees. The trees are coming into leaf like something almost being said. And what I said was, I think this is also the condition of music, mm. that it's not quite telling you anything, but it seems almost on the edge of telling you something. Rather like if you hear uh, a cello beautifully played, say Yo-Yo Ma playing a Bach, one of the Bach cello suites, you think it's almost like a voice and it's almost telling us something. And maybe some of the greatest painting is that which hovers between the representational and the abstract. It's never quite one or the other. I mean, Kandinsky, or, well, there are many, many examples. So to come back to your question, the music and its central character, I should just explain, is someone who, even at the age of 16, is, is playing Schubert's Fantasia. Who, you know, he's uh, destined to become a great piano player, and then his life is diverted rather because of this passionate affair, inappropriate affair he has with his piano teacher. Uh, that, that almost sense in fates as in music mm. uh, becomes an organizing factor um, and, and lingers on because he doesn't become a great concert pianist, but he ends up playing um, what's called munch music in, in a hotel bar um, but every now and then he's allowed to play something a little more jazzy. Um, and that again, uh, with especially one particular song, Round Midnight, becomes a very important element in, in, in memory and reunion. So it's not a matter of planning a novel with using music uh, as some sort of scheme, but the habits of thinking mm. um, of the all, almost things that happen to all the all the almost things that happen in our lives are colossal. Um, starting round about the moment of conception, uh, you know, Bob biologists point out that you know if your if your mum and dad made love five seconds later, you wouldn't be you. Uh, you you'd have a completely different confabulation, a rearrangement of of of, of the uh, combined genomes. Uh, and it's that almost sense of something almost happening, almost being said, that becomes an organising element. Mm. That sense of something almost being said seems to um, echo with Roland's experience of never um, of, of finding that those encounters so unresolvable. You know that he returns to them repeatedly, and, and that he's yeah. trying to decode mm. them in a certain way. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm often asked, in fact, I was asked this evening, um, you know, what lessons have I learned? Um, and I didn't really have time to talk at length, at any kind of space about this, but when we contemplate our lives, when we get to the point when we have enough adult life behind us, as well as uh, 
childhood and adolescence, uh, I think we're constantly re-examining and rewriting that story. Uh, it can be very highly mood dependent. I mean, remember that depressives are often people who cannot either anticipate pleasure or looking back, remember any pleasure in their lives. They're trapped in a negative state. So um, there are many, many things that happen to us in life uh, that are never solved, never resolved. And it's been the business of movies and novels, uh, and especially operas, to try and persuade us that things are concluded. Mm. Um, you know, the, the funny person with a, with a limp turns out to be your uncle all the time, and you know, the, the 19th century short story is full of such moments. Um, most things don't get resolved. Most problems don't get solved. They either get forgotten, which is a brilliant way of moving on, <laughs> or they just become part of who we are. We carry it as our baggage, our luggage. Mm. And as I've often said in public, one of the worst and most insidious new words in the English language is closure. There is not any closure for the great tragedies in life. There is simply absorption and learning to live with, as it were, your limp. Mm. Um, you suffer a terrible loss, uh, it becomes part of you. Mm. It is not solved. There is no, you know, there, there is no moment. So, uh, persistently through this novel, things are not solved. Mm. Even when Roland, 45 years later, goes to confront his piano teacher and gets her to explain herself by the end of it, all he feels is immense weariness. Just wants to go home, had enough, can't hear a bed here anymore. Um, and so uh, there's always a suspicion if you, when you enter your mid 70s, say, that you've learned nothing, nothing at all. Um, and yet, in some odd way, you feel slightly more qualified to exist. Uh, very hard to square these things, and I can't square them for anyone. All I can do, like all novelists will say, is, is lay them out for you. Well, that's, I'd like to get into your many qualifications for existing um, <laughs> later on in the, in the conversation, but I think this would be a great moment to hear a reading, and a, this particular moment draws us into the moment where um, Roland, in a sense, acquires that limp, or it begins to acquire that limp. Before I start, I just want to correct what was said at the beginning. I will only be reading the excerpt in English and not in French. <clears throat> this was insomniac memory, not a dream. It was the piano lesson again. An orange tiled floor, one high window, a new upright in a bare room close to the sick bay. He was 11 years old, attempting what others might know as Bach's first prelude from book one of the well-tempered clavier, simplified version, but he knew nothing of that. He didn't wonder whether it was famous or obscure. It had no when or where. He could not conceive that someone had once troubled to write it, the music was simply here, a school thing, or dark, like a pine forest in winter, exclusive to him, his private labyrinth of cold sorrow. It would never let him leave. The teacher sat close by him on the long stool, round-faced, erect, perfumed, strict. Her beauty lay concealed behind her manner. She never scowled or smiled. Some boys said she was mad, but he doubted that. He made a mistake in the same place, the one he always made, and she leaned closer to show him. Her arm was firm and warm against his shoulder. Her hands her painted nails were right above his lap. 
he felt a terrible tingling draining his attention. Listen. It's an easy rippling sound. But as she played, he heard no easy rippling. Her perfume overwhelmed his senses and deafened him. It was a rounded, cloying scent, like a hard object, a smooth river stone pushing in on his thoughts. Three years later, he learned it was rose water. Try again, she said. She said it on a rising tone of warning. She was musical. He was not. He knew that her mind was elsewhere and that he bored her with his insignificance. Another inky boy in a boarding school. His fingers were pressing down on the tuneless keys. He could see the bad place on the page before he reached it. It was happening before it happened. The same mistake was coming towards him. Arms outstretched like a mother, ready to scoop him up. Always the same mistake coming to collect him without the promise of a kiss. And so it happened. His thumb had its own life. Together they listened to the bad notes fade into the hissing silence. Sorry, he whispered to himself. Her displeasure came as a quick exhalation through her nostrils. A reverse sniff he had heard before. Her fingers found his inside leg just at the hem of his grey shorts and pinched him hard. That night there would be a tiny blue bruise. Her touch was cool as her hand moved up under his shorts to where the elastic of his pants met his skin. He scrambled off the stool and stood, flushed. Sit down. You'll start again. Thank you so much for that wonderful reading. And as you heard in that reading, this is, this is sort of in a way the, the moment of um, first encounter that then leads to a, an extended relationship that in the moment, about three years later, Roland, in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and there's a heightened sense of, of the world ending, he, he plunges himself, in a way, into, the, into a, as he puts it, premature love affair. The novel, at first, is a little reticent about framing this in any sort of, um, labeling it as such. So there's, the words used to describe the, his, his encounters with her are wounded, altered, She'd seeded into the fine grain, not only of his psyche, but of his biology. And yet later on, we, he starts to recognize it as, as abuse and call it such. And actually, that he recognizes that not being able to describe it as such is a function of, of the abuse. Going back through your writing, I'm struck by the fact that there are a number of encounters that, that are you could describe as abusive. And I wonder what draws you back to tracing the these particular kinds of encounters, these power imbalances and the traces that they, they leave? I think this comes back, I think this comes back to your first question um, about character and about time. Mm. That there are all kinds of things that happen to us in early life that leave a, a kind of shadow if, if they are negative things. Um, that shadow is hard to understand because you're living in it. Um, and in Roland's case, it takes a very long time, and it's a policeman um, who first uses the word um, abuse to him. And only then does it f sort of obviously fall into place, something that anyone else could have told him. He didn't need a policeman to come to his house. Um, so... The nature of memory through time is fascinating. We are not brilliant uh, at memory. We, we don't run past events like a sort of video. Clearly it hasn't been of much use to us over evolutionary time. Um, neuroscientists long ago were telling us that we don't actually remember the event, we remember the last time we remembered it. That's become something of a, of a cliche um, 
but it does point to the precarity, the, the, the difficult nature of memory. And when we are asked to, say, speak about our childhood, uh, my sense of most people's accounts is how hugely they change through time. Uh, for example, your account of your childhood could be very different once you've become a parent yourself. Mm -hmm. You might become a little more forgiving of your parents. Um, in other terms, you, know, you, you might become harsher as your life uh, diminishes or fails. Uh, and you want something to blame, you could blame your childhood. So th those accounts get rewritten. And I think um, because sexuality is, is such a profound wellspring of human behavior, of thoughts, fantasies, desires, actions, um, joy, um, disappointment, and so on, and is almost the backbone of, of, of the novel, I mean, Love and the end of love, you could almost say, was the plot of, of maybe three quarters of all novels ever written. Um, so a negative experience in childhood is, is a you know, really crucial, a crucial matter. And it's not only to do with abuse. It could be all kinds of mistakes or misunderstandings or um, expectations not met. There were so many different ways. So I think it's, it's, it's there for all of us in some way or other. Um, very few people just breeze from being a kind of pre-sexual child into a post or sexual adult uh, without tripping on something or knocking some precious vase off a, off a stand or you know, um, spilling some kind of tomato soup on someone else's lap. <laughs> uh, and uh, it becomes, you know, again, to come back to what I was just saying, it becomes part of what you are. Mm. Uh, and your sexual self, I no longer, I mean, I was a very keen Freudian in my early 20s. I read three essays on sexuality and the psychopathology of everyday life uh, and many, many of the uh, Freud's of monographs. Um, and it seemed to open a kind of door, which now seems to me absurd because there's, the, reducing everything in human motivation and memory, et cetera, to sexuality is a colossal reduction of, of all the things that we are and can be. Still, it did follow a, a narrative line of, uh, that led me into some very lurid short stories at the beginning of my career. And that has shrunk away. So maybe this is kind of opening up the subject from another perspective um, in, in this novel. Yes, I mean, I, I, that's very interesting you mentioned the early stories, because I did, did feel that there was, um, in many respects, because Lessons is so expansive and populous, it seems to, in some ways, echo or contain ancestries throughout many of your previous books, but in, it feels to me that there's also um, a greater expansion in, as well. I mean, with just to come on to memory and um, the way this relates to your, your own life, because you're a prodigious inventor of fictional lives, Miriam Cornell being a great example of this. She's a very vivid and entirely fictional being. But you've also spoken openly about how Lessons marks a departure for you and that it does contain or it, it references moments in your own life. Um, and you said previously, and I accept somewhat perhaps flippantly, that it's around three quarters invention and one quarter memory. Um, I wonder if there was a particular memory or touch point for you that, that may, have crea may have created that sea change or, or prompted you to want to draw those memories into your fiction. Well, I my childhood was in the 50s, uh, and that was a great decade of things not being said. Um, <laughs> And I'm sure one could say that of the 40s and 30s and <laughs> a great deal of Western civilization uh, in the centuries before that. Um, there is not a single seminal moment in my own past, but there were many tensions in my home, in, my ha in, in our domestic uh, environment. And 
some of that is, is, finds its way into the novel. There was a secret my parents held um, from us. I, I have th three siblings. Uh, two of them are half-siblings. Uh, and some great sadnesses. Um, you know, a child, when, when my mother's first husband was away fighting in the war, um, she had an affair with the man who would become my father. And the two children my mother had at that point were sent away uh, disastrously. Um, and then my mother's first husband died in the, uh, the D-Day landings, the liberation of Europe in um, 1944, leaving the ground open for my parents to marry. My mother had had a child with my father. She had given it away on a railway station to a couple who had answered a small ad in a newspaper. All a very lurid story. It could come out of a Thomas Hardy novel. Mm. Uh, with a lot of sadness in all directions for all of us. I was sent away to boarding school. Um, so we were all sent away one way or another. And um, nothing was ever said. Mm. It was never spoken about. It only, only discovered this baby then was 60 years old. Uh, and we met, uh, which is all in the novel. Uh, but that's a long silence. And I think so many of those tensions... Uh, a love affair, a baby, sex, um, lying, um, concealment, <laughs> I think have all played a large part as being a kind of mainspring in, in, in some of the things in my fiction, in ways that maybe even when I was writing those stories, I didn't fully understand mm. until I was writing lessons. So, yes, um, we speak in Western Europe, this is only relevant in Western Europe, didn't apply uh, Western Europe in the United States. What happened in the late 60s and early 70s? Uh, and, you know, yes, beginning of the second wave of feminism, uh, the environmental movement got going. Um, but I think, crucially, and, and not much spoken about, was the relationship between adults and children. Mm. I think it shifted. And it's got built upon since. In the old days, however much your parents loved you, they never spoke to you. I mean, they never had a conversation with you. Uh, the children were in one room, and I don't, you know, I didn't live in a house of nannies and being taken off to bed by them. But what I mean is, metaphorically, as it were, there was the world of children, there was the world of grown ups. Uh, and I notice that many of the younger people in my life have relationships with children that were unimaginable, unimaginable in the 50s. Uh, there was a book on drugs published two or three years ago by an American writer, and he said, if you want to know what it's like to take LSD, have breakfast with a four-year-old. Um, <laughs> and one knows what he's talking about. Yes. And, but I don't think my parents ever had, certainly they didn't have LSD, <laughs> but they never got that LSD experience of having breakfast with a four-year-old. Mm. Now it's, it's a common thing. It, it happens all the time. The madness of, of a conversation with children who are only two years into language is extraordinary and magical. Uh, so... Uh, I don't know how I, got, I got, really got to this, but to come back to this, yeah. this element of uh, what is the mainspring, um, all I can do is give you this general background. Um, I did not suffer any moment of particular cruelty, whose long shadow, etc. You know, I've lived in, but there was a family past and an extraordinary, almost like a sort of cathedral of silence mm. around it, and I think into that into that space, that emptiness and silence, uh, I became a writer. As someone who has breakfast every day with a four-year-old and a one-year-old, I want to ask you about that LSD experience in a moment. But the, um, I, I just want to ask you, in terms of navigating those memories and those, those moments from your life, in particular, your mother's story, um, 
what do you think that writing about them in fiction has done? Has it refracted them in a different way? Has it, has it caused you to see them differently in, in the process? Or is it just getting them out on the page? Well, I come back to what I said before. Nothing is solved. Yeah. Uh, those events happened. They're there. Um, and setting them out was maybe a clarifying experience. But, I mean, um, I didn't learn anything new. Mm. And nor did I think uh, I had closure with it. Um, it's all still there. And so, yeah. uh, no. And I've never really believed in writing as therapy. Mm. Uh, it might be for others, but I, uh, I can't see how it would work, really. Because you know what you know, and you put down on the page what you know. Uh, and you're not going to put down anything new. Uh, so I'm sceptical of that. To, to come on to, to parenthood, and I, in particular fatherhood, because it feels like fatherhood is very central to this novel. When you were describing a moment ago that sense of how we read ourselves back through the ages and how we look back mm -hmm. on our... It reminds me of that, that famous Mark Twain quip that when I was 16, I thought my father was an idiot, and now I'm 25, I'm amazed by how much he's learned. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a really wonderful, um, full... Uh, almost full lifetime portrait of fatherhood and, and, and grandfatherhood as well, at be beginnings of which, anyway. Um, Roland's father is a, uh, from a particular generation, a particular kind of military man, as you say, not necessarily involved in breakfast in the way that certainly Roland is. And Roland has, he it seems to be one of the saving graces for him in the novel that he is a, a tender father who feel, it seems to be, um, in some ways, for a time at least, saved by his relationship with father. That he's, his relationship with Lawrence, his son, is something that anchors him at particular moments in his life. But what you also show us is, in his later years, the way that, that, that he is also uh, left, or you know, as, parents of, as, as, we, as parents are, that, that, ch that children move on, they grow up, and so on. It, it's felt to me like I hadn't seen a portrait of a young father, certainly a single young father in fiction, traced all the way through like that. And I wonder if you felt that there was a gap or that, that you felt that, that that depiction of fatherhood was something that you wanted to, to see on the page that perhaps wasn't there before. Not particularly. I mean, it really just grew out of what I'd already set up, as it were. Um, so a couple who are very much in love, uh, and they have a baby, seven months old, and one day uh, the mother simply vanishes, leaves a, a message on the, on the bed saying that she loves uh, him, Roland, but um, she's gone. She'd made a mistake. Um, and she goes on to become Europe's greatest novelist. Because I, one element of this exploration is how we uh, forgive men doing this, but we don't forgive the women. Um, so Roland is perforce uh, raising a child on his own, and, on, and he's on social security. That wasn't my experience. Uh, I raised my children uh, with their mother in a loving environment. Um, but I certainly remembered, I mean, I was, I, because I worked at home, I was, I was involved, as it were. Um, I'd taken the acid. Um, <laughs> and whether that's been described in other novels or not, I had no idea. I mean, mm. how many novels can one read in a year? And I'm sure there are other people who, you know, it must be out there, simply because it's a strong experience. Uh, at one point, I describe parenthood as a double helix of labor and love. Um, and there's a certain kind of amnesia to parenthood. I mean, many women speak of the extraordinary amnesia that allows one to have another child. You know? um, uh, and thank God, maybe maybe it is a sort of one of those tricks of um, evolution to make sure we don't just have one uh, too far below replacement level. Um, so yes, uh, one draws on. Yeah, here's one of the great distorting elements of um, of memory: photographs. 
Mm. Uh, photographs you tend to take when everyone's happy and on holiday, and you have a boxfuls of them. There are no crying children. I mean, uh, there are no angry parents. There's no one falling asleep in the middle of cooking dinner. <laughs> it's all, you know, marvelous stuff by the seaside. Very destructive of accurate memory. Um, I, I can barely remember the tiredness, but I, I knew it was there, so I had to invent it almost. Mm. Um, I used to write on an Olivetti um, in the, when the children were very young, and I, I had this fantasy. I used to think it was a memory, but I now know it's completely impossible. I would sometimes fall asleep while writing in the, um, in the late morning, and that Olivetti in reverse, and it had that sort of little <laughs> thing on the, that my head, uh, that only if you go in front of the mirror would you see Olivetti. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not true, but I sort of, I faked up that memory of it. Um, As someone who's right in the middle of that right now, I, I have to say it's a very vivid and compelling portrait, down to you know, Lawrence's nap times and the way that L Roland manages to, to sort of eke out a little bit of writing time. But I want to ask you about the other side. Uh, you look extraordinarily awake. So. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about the, the other side of that relationship, as it were, with uh, Alyssa, you mentioned, who, as she, she leaves home, uh, their home, to, to take on her career as a, um, as a writer and, as you say, becomes the great German novelist of her era, of her generation. Um, you write at one point, um, the literary biographies teemed with wives and children abandoned for a higher calling. And, and Alyssa says to Roland later on, you know, do you remotely understand how difficult it's been historically for women to create, to be artists, scientists, to write and paint? Um, it seemed to me that there was, that, that you deliberately inverted that dynamic that mm -hmm. so often it is the the um, male writer or male artist who's doing that and there's an invocation of Robert Lowell and the dolphin Elizabeth Hardwick in his um, his you could say cruel treatment of her in that book um, I wondered that if that was a, uh, a deliberate decision to to invert that gender dynamic that so often plays out well yes uh, again everything follows from having a kind of alter ego, because, I mean, there's a great deal of me in, in this central character. Uh, so that follows that he's not, he's, he's a failed poet. Uh, he lives on the margin of things, teaching, uh, coaching tennis, playing in a hotel bar and so on. Um, and he is almost everything I might have been or wanted to have been if I had not become a writer, because very early on, um, by the time I was 20, I was absolutely determined never to have a job. Um, or, you know, by which I mean a career. Uh, and I did all kinds of holiday jobs. And I was, when I left school, I uh, worked four months for Camden Council as a dustman, for example. And I worked on endless building sites. All those jobs were very easy to get in those days, by the way. They're another kind of big difference um, between opportunities for writers now and then. Um, but I didn't really set out with any kind of program in mind with this novel, except given that Roland is going to have to raise his child alone, given that uh, one of the issues in not only in this novel, but in many, many conversations of everyone who loves books, is how, or, or, or any forms of cultural expression, how do we square a beautiful piece of, of literature or painting, whatever it is, music, when we know that the composer, the writer, the artist was a vile person? Um, we don't want to cancel them, I hope. They just has to be, to come back to my, my running theme here, part of the story, part of cultural's, culture's limp, as it were. Mm. Uh, some very suspect types have created some very wonderful things, and we have to somehow live with that. Um, so it's not only about the double standard by which we judge men and women in relation to their responsibilities towards their children and their art, 
but um, how we square things with the works we love and uh, the people who invent them. Uh, my first real entanglement with that was reading, and I'm glad to say this in the French Institute, uh, Céline. Uh, but then the more I read, heard about Céline, the more revolting I found it. But I, the journey to the end of the night, I was just completely obsessed by when I was 17 or 18. Uh, then I, I sort of had to sort of disown it. But then it's there, you know, you can't get around it. Um, and there are many, many examples of that. I mean, the anti-Semitism of Dostoevsky, well, we can't cancel Dostoevsky, but we have to confront the fact, etc. You know, it goes on. The cancel culture has got this completely wrong. You've got to embrace the, all of it and deal with it. You know, it is part of you know, the complexity of, of who we are, what we are, and what we create. So, yeah, that's my yeah. tortuous um, answer to the question that I can't even remember. <laughs> it's very illuminating. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I want to open it out to the audience here to ask some questions. But the novel is very much a portrait of Roland through his life, but it also, it, through him, it also refracts a portrait of a wider generation, and in a sense of a, as you put towards the end of the novel, so many lessons unlearned within what you might call the West. And I wonder if um, it felt to you as though, I mean, some of your novels have, in recent times have been um, particularly trenchant about the, the lessons unlearned in, the, in, in our culture. And I wonder if you felt that it was important for you to signal an echo between Roland's journey, um, not learning as he goes, and what's been going on in the wider culture. And you referenced this in your, um, in your acceptance speech of the, the award you received this evening earlier on. Yeah. Um... I'm not sure how to answer that, but uh, history never quite repeats itself. But watching events in Ukraine unfold, I sometimes think, and reading actually uh, a few months ago, there was a, a huge set to tank battle in eastern Ukraine with something like 500 tanks involved. I've never seen any film of this, but read quite a lot of accounts. Um, such battles were taking place on the edge of the Roman Empire you know, in, in the first uh, century BC. Um, and they took place you know, in 1942, 43, 44, in, across Europe. Uh, that sense of here is a dictatorship with violent expansionist intentions and what is Europe going to do about it? Mm. Uh, well, it did things very reluctantly and very slowly. And it's possible if events do not go well for Ukraine in this um, massive at you know, attack that's going to take place any day now, that if it fails, historians might well be saying, why didn't we learn? If you're going to do this, do not trickle these weapons out one by one. Do not go into a great hissy fit over whether you're going to allow jet airplanes. And then, just been announced, we're going to give uh, the Ukrainians the most advanced jets, the F-16s. Um, you've got to do it all at once, because we've already had this war um, in Europe. And now we're having it again, a different adversary, but very similar intentions. Lebensraum. Although a nation with 11 time zones hardly needs any more Laban's realm. But anyway, uh, that degree of slight variation, it's like it's, we were listening to the Diabelli variations. They're, they're all on the same chord progressions, but it is different each time. And the trick is to recognize it. The other great point of recognition is whether an event is a gateway to a better future, or simply a trough. And a big part of this novel is set at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. I was there when it came down. I thought it was a gateway to a whole new dispensation in European politics and, and global politics. 
it turned out to be a peak. Uh, very difficult to tell at the time. Uh, then you could do that in reverse. Um, is Putin, or for that matter, Trump, a dismal politician? Um, is he a trough or a gateway? I mean, in other words, let's suppose he gets a second term. Is the United States drifting towards an authoritarian dispensation that will completely undo uh, its democracy? Or is it just a bad moment? You know, and we look back and say, phew, you know, we got through that and, uh, and we can put things back together again. Very, very hard to tell, but extremely interesting to be engaged in the business of trying to work out um, those distinctions, peaks and troughs, gateways. Um, it's often said that good journalism is, is history's first draft, mm -hmm. and good journalists, I think we've become hugely dependent. And you know, we have many, many conversations about all the deleterious matters of the internet, but it has been a golden age of the long form essay by uh, hundreds of gifted journalists, many of whom have risked their lives to, to bring stuff back to us. Again, always a mixed story, always a mixed story. Wonderful, thank you so much. I have lots more questions I'd like to ask, but I want to give the audience a chance to ask questions. So, hi. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you for where memory fails us and pictures delude us. You fill in the spaces for us, as you mentioned. I have uh, two questions. One is uh, the the scenes that you have, or the the depictions you have, where there's some sexual tension. For me, as a reader, it's very easy. I trust you to to relay that scene to me, and I just go with it. And I was thinking, as an author how difficult it is to be authentic about it, whether you're using personal experience or do you have to do research, whether it's very difficult for you to come to terms and express those things. And then a second question I had, I have a, a friend of mine who wants to be an author and uh, she says, you know, all these characters in my head, I don't know, I have to get them out and so on and so forth. And I come from an engineering background and I know, you know, th there's a program in my head and I want to get that out or something. I wanted you to express how it is to be an author and how is it different? How did you feel, probably younger, you being different from the people around you? Thank you. Well, two very interesting questions. Um, well, writing about, let's say, love rather than sex, um, you can't make it up. <laughs> I mean, you've got to, I mean, so inevitably your own experience is going to play a part. But into that mix, uh, your imagination can, can run wild. So that, I mean, that's, the, that's, that's your easier question. Uh, as for your friend, uh, she has all these characters in her head. Well, lucky her. I mean, uh, get on with it. Stop complaining. Um, I often quote um, a wonderful lecture that Vladimir uh, Nabokov gave in 1953 to his beginning year one students, 1953, Cornell University. And he was telling them how to read. But I think he was actually subconsciously telling us also, the writers through the ages, how to write. He said to these kids, listen, you know nothing. You've read almost nothing. Forget writing about themes in novels. You're not worthy of talking about themes. Generalization is moonshine. Forget it. When you read a novel, I want you all to have a pencil in your hand, and I want you to fondle the details. Now, that resonates with me a great deal because I think novels are built from the ground up, and I think you as an engineer might appreciate that you know, uh, before you have this machine, you've got to have a cog, as it were, um, we start with sentences, with words, phrases, snippets, and build. And a novel has to be built by sentences. It has to be built 
by paragraphs, and then subsections and chapters. But it, it, it's rather like um, bricklaying. And, an, and another simile in this is painting. When you see the palimpsests of great paintings exposed to us through X-ray, and you see how underneath the drawing lies on, is now covered also with paint, but that paint is also covered by what you're seeing. You see how things have been shaped and moved around and minds changed about the disposition of, of different things. If you'll just work with the detail, and I would say to your friend, just choose one of those characters. <laughs> you don't want a whole society in your head. You'll never get going. Uh, stay with one and see what happens to her or him, and uh, the rest can come on stage in due course. Can you wave your hand? Can you wave your hand if you're speaking so I know where to direct my fond gaze? Is there another question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. You've talked, I haven't read the book lessons, I haven't read much of your work, but you've talked about really what it means to be human, especially in your reflections in this discussion. Are there any influences, particularly you've mentioned Freud earlier in your life, but are there any other sort of philosophical or other interests that have led you to come to your ways of writing and thinking, or, 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 or is it just free flow as you've matured and developed? I'd just be interested in that. Well, like most writers, I came to writing through reading, really. Uh, passionate reader as a child, as an adolescent, and onwards. And I, I mean, it's not very helpful for me to say this, but all of it becomes part of, I mean, especially all of it that you loved and remember, or think you remember. Uh, so, for me, uh, yes, in my early 20s it was Freud, um, but also the fiction of Kafka meant a great deal to me the dark humour of it, the strange disembodied nature of some of those stories. Um, science has been a very large uh, element of my reading passions. Um, so reading Darwin for the first time was immensely important and I often think back to those glorious final pages of The Origin of Species in which he contemplates a hedgerow um, and speaks, again, a, a, a hymn to the nature of building botting up. You know, from, from such, he's talking of the cycles of, of life and death and extinctions rising and falling. He's staring into a hedgerow and thinking of all the variety of species and how, how an explosion of variation come from such quite simple processes. And he says... Um, that there is grandeur in this view of life. And so I think within the scientific revolutions that happened four or five hundred years ago, but also preceded by the mathematics of, 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 of the Greeks and, and their philosophy, um, that rational pursuit of uh, human culture has been really one of the great glories, enthralling, grand achievements of, of, of human thought. On top of that, well, for me, um, philosophically, I count myself in that tradition that begins with Locke um, and goes to Hume. And, uh, and strangely for me, I'm uh, uh, Berkeley, too. Uh, I'm much more of an English pragmatist, therefore, than a German idealist. Um, and, uh, oh, this is a time and place to tell this joke that always goes the rounds in diplomatic circles, uh, always told by um, French, uh, oh, sorry, by uh, English uh, Eurosceptics. Um, and it was a well-known American uh, diplomat talking to uh, a French diplomat about a proposal before the UN, and the French diplomat says, um, I can see how that's going to work in practice, but how is that going to work in theory? <laughs> <laughs> that's the sort of joke we like to tell. 
uh, it was Madame, Madame Albright who told that story. So when you next meet her, Madame Ambassador, you, you might wrap her knuckles. I'm, I'm conscious we might have run out of time. Do we have time for one more question? One more question? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, good evening. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Tom. Um, you touched upon Russia's war uh, in Ukraine, and um, I was wondering perhaps um, if you could comment how you see, especially given that... Uh, you being a writer and the book obviously touching on music forming a big part of the book how 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 can western artists whatever that may be you know what what role do you see that they perhaps play in the con in the in the current global context if a role at all well we you know i've done events you know reading ukrainian poetry and um allowed to groups of people and um, write pieces but you know we're not players in this, um, but yet we are part of the the culture. That um, so uh, it's worth everyone, I think, voicing their opinions. Uh, I I know that I, I have no pretensions to any special sway in this. But once it started, I I was one of the impatient people who thought that if we're going to help Ukraine, we should do it wholeheartedly from the beginning. And of course, we should have done it in 2014. Um, and we should have learned that lesson from the 1930s. That's my point. Um, but yeah, um, there's a ve this is slightly to one side of that. But uh, talking to friends in Berlin um, who are hosting a lot of Ukrainian refugees, but also artists and activists, the Ukrainians will not share a stage with Russian dissidents. I mean, I'm not sure whether they're Russian, but these are Russians who have been thrown out or, or, or on the run, as it were, from the state of their country. But they just cannot bring themselves to do it. And at first, um, one's thought was, no, no, but they're on our side in this. You know, we, but the sense, I think, is visceral. They just cannot bear to hear Russian spoken, and they want to have anything to do with it. Uh, that will change over time, I'm sure, especially if, if, if this uh, great mil military moment succeeds. But there you see cultures just split apart. You know, after um, the news reached us back of the torture and executions, um, Bakhmut and so on, uh, it just became impossible for, and these are not uh, you know, mature Ukrainian artists will not sit down with Russians who are on their side. Uh, and it's become a policy now. Um, so thinking one's way into that, uh, you can give all the poetry <laughs> readings you want, you know, but um, unfortunately it's the bullet that's going to decide this. On that note, I think we have to sadly draw to a close. Um, Ian, it's been such a pleasure and a privilege talking to you about your writing. And this is such a masterful, multitudinous, completely and utterly compulsive novel. I really, if you haven't read it yet, I really urge you to grab a copy. It's, um, it's, in a it's out in paperback. That's so, paperback. Great. Soon. Not yet. Next month. Uh, good. Um, but thank you so much for all your insights and your generosity. And thank you for having us. Thank you. A real pleasure. Thank you.